previous verse gives some in-depth background to the next verse. So if you haven't listened to the previous video, it might be a good idea to do so, although it's not necessary. Verse 862 Defiled by the bad theories of the philosophers, Hashtasaya, etc., are wrapped and enveloped with the false discriminations of the Manovignana. They imagine fire, etc., are purifying. In the previous verse, we looked at the discriminating mind and how it creates our reality. Occasionally I try to get over a certain prejudice I have with regards to philosophy. I start trying to read it and appreciate where philosophers are coming from. Because obviously some of the finest minds have been devoted to the subject. I should just say, I'm assuming that Hash Desaya is a philosopher. I couldn't find any information on him on Google. So he may, he's maybe a philosopher that's been lost to history. Or maybe it's a typo and it's somebody else here. But it doesn't really matter. Some philosophers, well, there was one philosophical essay that I read recently, which took as its subject spirituality. And the author seemed to have a pretty good take on how modern spirituality expresses itself. I might as well say who it is. It was Thomas Metzinger. It was an essay called Spirituality and Intellectual Honesty. <coughs> Probably shouldn't have mentioned them because I don't want to be, I don't like to be disparaging. It was a good essay actually, as essays go, it was a good essay. Although I got the impression that he was weaving some strands from a mass of confusion. And he did raise some very pertinent points about well, let's take the example of what I'm talking about in these videos, enlightenment practice. Am I really talking about enlightenment? What do I know about enlightenment? Is what I'm experiencing what it claims to be and not some form of self-delusion? And Metzinger goes on to talk about how self-delusion is hardwired into us. So it's, it's, uh, so if you're talking about not being deluded, what's your claim to this? And is this sense of liberation not just an arrangement of neurons in the brain? So these are very pertinent points. And, uh, I think it's quite good if anybody that's interested in or has got any claim to insight or enlightenment, they should address these points. And I do think I've addressed these points in the course of these many videos. It might be good to address them again, but I, I don't actually think this is the place for it. So I would say that is probably one of the most pertinent. Well, actually, the, the essay itself wasn't particularly pertinent, but he did make a couple of very pertinent points. And I was looking at another philosopher who takes a lot of, inspira of his inspiration from Buddhism. Now, I have to say I haven't read his books. I've just looked at some web pages that he's produced. And uh, I really can't see anything in it of any spiritual value. I don't know whether he claims it to be of spiritual value, although I get the impression that he assumes it does. Um, and he does call it a philosophy. And philosophy is about mentation. 
It's about the mind. And it's about constructing models. Just like science says, good philosophy constructs models. It gives us models. And spirituality is not concerned with models. And I think this is what this verse is criticizing. <coughs> in fact, the philosophers of old in India were concerned with purification, purifying the spirit. And this would entail purifying the body or somehow overcoming the inclinations of the body through all sorts of ascetic practices. And the previous verse told us though that mind, sentient beings and nirvana are already primarily pure. So this is the bad theories of the philosophers. They're wrapped and enveloped with the false discriminations of the mano vijnana. And this is simply the mind. It's, it's thoughts, ideas, feelings even. And they imagine fire, etc., to be purifying. Fire was used as a metaphor a couple of verses back. I think it's just being used in its ordinary sense here. Purifying fire. The use of ash and all the rest of it. So it's very important to step beyond mentation, to step beyond models of reality. Somebody actually wrote a book about the Sagatakam. It was more of a pamphlet than a book. And I wrote a review of it on Amazon. And it was a little disappointing to say the least. Because this person was obviously very clever at written this book. And he had all sorts of ideas about the Sagatakam, even tying in mathematical notions with it. And this isn't what the Sagatakam is about. It's not a vehicle for generating new ideas. And this guy's actually written several books. I don't know if they're all in response to the Sagatakam, but I suspect he's just got one of these very fertile minds. I'm sure the books are very fascinating. He actually offered me some free copies of them, but I, I, I haven't actually been able to reply, I'm sure. They're very interesting, but I doubt whether I'll understand them, and I doubt that I'll feel any of the richer for having struggled through them. This isn't what the Sagaticum is about. The Sagaticum is pointing us beyond mentation, beyond thought, to something else. Metzinger might, the philosopher Metzinger, might find this a bit suspicious. But then, this is what music does. Music po points us towards to something beyond thought. And if we start talking about our response to the music, what's that got to do with intellectual honesty? What we want is emotional honesty, I suppose, if we're going to talk about any kind of honesty. So in a way, I suppose I've answered one of the criticisms, or at least partially answered it. Intellectual honesty is not relevant to spiritual insight. What is relevant is clarity, clarity. And one of the ways I've tested myself is by expounding on these verses. And it's up to you to decide whether I'm talking rubbish or not. But hopefully, as you look at these verses, as you contemplate these verses, and you use these videos as some kind of assistant 
as some kind of resource, you'll find them useful. I'm making no claims for myself. I'm simply expanding on these verses from where it seems these verses are pointing to. This is one of the things that opened up to me on my own realization. And I'm not saying I am realized. Most of the time I'm not. It comes and goes. This is the nature of realization. It's not a permanent state. You might wish to believe it's a permanent state, but that's up to you. Maybe it is and I just not hit it yet. I'm not that bothered, to be honest. I've not, I'm not aspiring to permanence. I practice. I aspire to ongoing practice. I'm an enlightenment practitioner. If we have to have a label, that's the label. Most of the time I'm just an ordinary guy dragging myself through life. Well, it's not quite as bleak as that, but that tends to be part of my self-image. So, um, yeah, we need to be very wary of getting caught up in philosophy. By all means, read philosophy, enjoy it, appreciate it like you would appreciate a good piece of music. It's sometimes very wonderful to see a good mind at work. But usually, I, find, I, th I think philosophy is also, can also be very dishonest intellectually, because they've always got these automatic assumptions. Mexico himself is quite clear he's got these assumptions of a self and a physical world. And he's very much interested in the models we make of this world and the models we make of ourself. This has got nothing to do with spirituality. But these are the assumptions that he holds on to. These are the assumptions that it seems that he's operating from. I might be wrong because he hasn't stated that he clearly does have certain assumptions. Maybe he's not aware of his own assumptions, in which case it's arguable that he's not actually being intellectually honest himself. <coughs> but I don't want to make any accusations. I haven't studied his work. I'm not inclined to. It's, it's not my area of interest and it's not relevant to spiritual insight. And I think this is very much not just the spirit of this verse, but the spirit of the Lankavatara Sutra, the spirit of the Mahayana. We have to get beyond the philosophizing mind. Spirituality has got nothing to do with this. I'll just finish with verse 863. Those who see reality as it is in itself is a spirituality will see their passions burst asunder. Leaving the forest of bad analogies behind, they reach the realm of the wise. And the forest of bad analogies is the likes of philosophy. It's the inclination to talk about spirituality, the inclination to philosophize spirituality. Spirituality has got nothing to do with it. It's a forest of bad analogies, the forest of metaphors, The mind can get wonderfully entangled in this. <laughs> and if that's your game, okay. But since you're here, we can move beyond entanglement. And we'll see our passions burst asunder. This is like this is like waking up from a fetish. Most fetishes are pretty ridiculous. I'm talking about sexual fetishes. I, I'm not really talking from experience here, I should say. <laughs> but uh, when you look at people's sexual fetishes, you normally they normally invoke a laugh, don't they? You know, somebody might have a fetish for feet, 
or latex or something like that or muddy shoes so it's funny but from the point of the person experiencing the fetish it is deadly serious it taps into some very fundamental a very fundamental source of thrill of pleasure If you can think about it from those that find it funny, this is like the passions being burst asunder. They're quite ridiculous. Our passions are quite ridiculous. So you imagine how you might feel about other, one, other people's fetish, how ridiculous and laughable they are. This is the same with all our passions. They're all pumped up distortions. So let's allow them to blow up. And you might be concerned with, well, what else will you have? This is what gives meaning to your life, your fetishes. So it gives a bit of excitement to your day. And it, it's this, and, I have, and I have to come back now to this thing about our own awareness, which seems so boring and mundane. But I hope over the course of some of these videos, I've pointed out how exciting and miraculous this is. I've spoken of the struggle to practice enlightenment, to practice realization, but actually it's a joy. It really is a joy. And this is to be realized, we're actually opening the door to unconditional joy. But the habits are very strong. But if we, we can remember this, if we can remember that we're opening the door to unconditional joy and other delights, then come on. Stop piddling around with these ridiculous fetishes, these ridiculous passions and the passion here is are those things which engage the attention we're not talking about you know romantic passion we're talking about what hijacks the attention what hijacks the attention where is our attention consistently going to where does it like to dwell where's its little happy place that's constantly striving for where's its comfort zone that, that it wants to wrap itself in a certain bunch of thoughts or discomfort zone even because perversely enough the attention has got the habit of wrapping itself in unpleasant thoughts as well wrapped and enveloped with false discriminations that's the habit we've got. So let's remember, we have the opportunity here of being open, spacious, loving, and tapping into a source of unconditional joy. <laughs>